I expected some responses coming from Shane Larkin and Will Clyburn throughout the night after the game because I, I believe that they both got a lot of a lot of stuff coming at them, you know, on, on Twitter. Uh, Even I, my, 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 my actual mm-hmm. tweet was also quoted a few times by Turkish basketball fans, but, you know, of course, there were these, these comments were coming all over the place, and especially Fenerbahce fans the best this opportunity. The best tweet of the night was by uh, Savas, who is, uh, I think, in our BN Plus community. Yeah. And he wrote, I don't know who the best small forward in Europe is, but now Clyburn has plenty of time to watch on TV and decide for himself. <laughs> <laughs> that was tough. Uh, that's harsh. That but uh, true at the same time. Harsh ending for, for FS. You know, we were kind of sure. Okay, you were the one saying that Basconia will qualify to get rid of Maccabi. But I mean, they were the hottest team in the year league. And they yeah, that's probably true. the coldest team in the year league, at least in the second half of the regular season. And to end the year league season this way, you know, they had the best offensive rating in the EuroLeague for this for the entire season, actually. Despite their record, they mm-hmm. were the best defen- uh, offensive team, according to Bibolytics. And they crashed. They scored 64 points in the game of the season. The best defense won. Like, Virtus won that game with their defense, not by their offense, not by scoring more points. They just stopped FS. I mean, to score 14 points, uh, sorry, 20 points in the last 18 and a half minutes, you know, in the third and fourth quarter, and uh, everybody was just playing their ass off on defense from Virtus, Payola, uh, everyone in the first Abudu half. Abudu Abbas. Abudu Man, Abbas. Abudu Abbas. I, I, that I was can amazing. barely remember Will Clyburn and his three-pointer being blocked by anybody, you know, because he has a high release, he has a nice size, it's really tough to block his shot. So, you know, at that point of the game, I think it was two minutes remaining. It yeah. was a crazy block, crazy block. And then afterwards, there was the steal by Shengelia. Also, uh, he took the ball from Will Claburn. But before, Ife Lindbergh contested Shane Larkin's three-pointer mm. really well. It was also one of these last shots. So, tremendous defensive effort by Virtus and after just, this horrible start. Yeah, and uh, you can remember in the first half... Uh, even to okay, let's start from the beginning. Like we were all, oh, we uh, were shocked. Uh, yeah. I said to you, we were watching the game together, and we were like, I was like, why Bellinelli is guarding Will Kleiber to start when uh, I think Daniel Hackett was on uh, Eustace Hollats. I know Hackett is smaller, but at the same time, Marco uh, Will Kleiber scored uh, this all the all these points in the first quarter. Seventeen points in the first six minutes of the game. Seventeen points, and he finished with twenty. <sighs> A little bit more, yeah. I think, but still, 22. Yeah, and uh, Virtus admitted that mistake pretty quickly because after five minutes, uh, Hackett went to guard him and Bellinelli never was close to, to Clyburn during the whole game. And, and, and it was like, it was a weird decision. But after that crazy start by Will, later there was like, Ante Zizic and uh, Polonara at one time in the first half looked like the best uh, defensive rim protecting uh, Duo in the league. Former FS players, by the way. Both. Exactly. Rewenstein. You, you might even say FS rejects. You you, you can clearly you can say, say that. that. I mean, yeah. I mean, okay, Dunstan, Dunstan won titles no, there. Dunstan, he's, yeah. he's a legend Dunstan there. Dunstan was an important piece of the But both of these two left mid-season. Mm. Uh, Polonara last year, to yeah. Jargiris from FS, yeah. and this year Gigi left uh, for Virtus. And they had an impact in this Big impact. decisive game. I think that they kind of changed the defensive picture in the second quarter, becoming, you know, greatest rim protectors of all time, basically, five, that night. Five blocks in the first half by those two guys. Two and by Polonara. Two by Polonara. And, or, even, or even I think they finished with six in the first half, six blocks. So that, that was an amazing performance, game-changing. And then I loved what Luca Banki did to start the third quarter because uh, he understood this game will be won not by offense, but by defense. And he started the third quarter with both Shengelia and Bellinelli on the, on the bench, instead opting to go with a five of uh, Zizic, Polnara, Avudo Abbas, Lundberg, and Hackett. So there's like, at, at, for, from one point of view, or like how this five is going to score. But at the same time, they're getting the stops against Shane Larkin, against Will Clyburn, and against FS number one offense in the league. So I really like that move. And then it was just, uh, I don't know. You could even say probably heart over talent, you know, won this game. Be- because what, what Virtus did in, 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 in the end, 
especially defensively, was really impressive. So, yeah, just the entire game was was really crazy. One of the craziest games, not the highest quality game, that's for sure, but one of the craziest games because if there was an advanced stats stat that would track the number of jump balls happened in one game, it for sure would be <laughs> season high. <laughs> if there would be some advanced stats tracking how much time on the floor players spent throughout the game, it for sure would be the season high. So hell of the game, hell of an players upset. Players spent more in that four overtime game in Madrid. Ah, okay. <laughs> that was also made <laughs> the case. was but involved in it as well. But it's overtime, you know, so yeah. it's, it changed the picture. But it, it was a hell of the game. Ife Lundberg, clutch, clutch player of the year. Five or even six decisive shots this season. And I rewatched them right before this this podcast, mm. all of them. This was probably the easiest one the de- from the defensive. like Because Larkin didn't get his Larkin up. didn't get any contest on that. And uh, all the other shots, like uh, he made... Uh, this was the third step back to the left that he made in decisive yeah. moments this season. Uh, there was one against Jan Vesely. There was one against, uh, I think, uh, Alan Smilagic. And uh, this was the hardest one because on, on I think against Vesely, after the step back, he even had to pump fake and then only shoot here. Mm. He just stepped back, a lot of space. He knocked down the shot, but wow, I think like we could all agree he's the clutchest player of, of the year. But I, I know Cody Miller McIntyre could have a case, but five or even six shots like this this season is just is just ridiculous in in 35 games. And it's crazy because he it's not like he he had a good season in general. I mean, maybe an okay season, but even if you look at the numbers at the averages, you can't say that he was performing at his highest level. Mm. But at the same time, you're talking about him as the clutchest player of the year because well, usually you would think about players that actually are superstars in their teams like Larkin, like James and Baldwin and many others. And now all of a sudden, Ife Lundberg has all these clutch shots throughout the season, even though he averages 9.4 points per game and shoots 34% from beyond the arc. So hmm. it's kind of crazy. It just shows probably the player's mentality. Oh, yeah. It, it shows probably. the player's mentality also from the standpoint where he was about to leave Virtus. You know, he yeah. was out of the rotation. Uh, before the season, there were a lot of rumors that he might leave, he might be uh, cut uh, before the season. And now he he stayed, he earned his minutes, he found his role, you know, and he's deci- deciding games for one of the biggest Cinderella's uh, of the season. Yeah. And the Cinderella story continues. Well, was it, it him that wrote on Twitter uh, the way the way everybody understood it? He's staying in Virtus. That he wrote, "We need a nanny in, yeah. in Bologna." Yeah. That was That's a crazy, crazy turnaround. <laughs> that was like a crazy tweet. In the um, middle of September, you don't know if you're staying. You r- you write this tweet. I think after the Luke Banky takes over. Yeah, I think probably that, a few I days think, after. I think that played a huge part as well. Could be. I'm not sure. Yeah. But it's just a crazy turnaround that you are not two weeks before the Euroleague season. You are not sure if you are going to play for this team, and then eight months later, you have uh, six decisive shots for this mm. team, and you. Uh, surprisingly, because everybody thought FS is going to win at home, you take them to, yeah. to that last playing game. Amazing. It's just, it's just funny how uh, these teams finished in the playing going through two absolutely completely different paths, like uh, mm. Virtus Bologna being the second seed after the first part of the season, then struggling in the, in the second part as much as falling down to the 10th seed, losing the last game of the season to Basconia, losing the home court advantage in the play-in. Because uh, after the first part of the season, we had a case for Luca Banchi as coach of the year and, and Virtus as, uh, as a team that could compete not only for the playoffs, but actually for a home court advantage. Then they ended up being the 10th seed. And, and when we're talking about FS, we're talking about a team that basically played a final every week in Euroleague for mm. the last month and they went all the way uh, they worked really hard they beat Fenerbahce away from home they got these very important wins they they got that blowout win versus Vesda in the last game and all of a sudden they're in the ninth seed they actually had a home court for this game so um, it's crazy to me that Virtus actually won it because they seemed like a team out of gas for the last couple of months 
in my eyes. Yeah. I I actually thought that this is it for them. Everybody uh, did. <laughs> and I'm thinking it right now still because I do believe that in Buesa Are Arena, Basconia, with Monekia or without Monekia should overcome Virtus. But still, they are in a position to make it to the playoffs and and have a series with Real Madrid. So uh, <clears throat> to me, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Mm. FS, it feels like a wasted opportunity. Uh, at the same time, I think this is the moment where we can accept that Tomislav Mijatovic uh, won't be the head coach for the next season and they will probably be looking for for those hmm. big names in the market yeah Bas basketball is this is why basketball is beautiful because Virtus were three and ten I think in the last games of the year league before coming into this and FS were eight and two and all of a sudden you get this team that won only three times after the new year uh yeah. winning away game that was completely not logical, you know, against against every logic. Yeah, it's against all odds. They were, I would say, big underdogs. Mm -hmm. So some might say that, okay, these teams are evenly matched. I, I, I would say that they were huge underdogs coming into mm -hmm. this game. So as you see, this is the Urbanus podcast, guys. If yeah. We're here to share our playing reactions. We're going to share our predictions for the last playing game. But on top of that, we're here also to pick our year league regular uh, season awards. Uh, it's going to be a few intense weeks for the bonus crew because we're here about uh, we're about to um, do the podcast basically after every big game, such as the playing games, we're going to do the podcast on weekend. And also we're going to do the podcast after every round of the Euroleague playoffs. It's in, in case something crazy happens, like last year it happened with Real Madrid and Partizan, we might be recording the podcast basically every every single day. And it's a great timing to join B and Plus community because we're going to have Basket News crew members in all eight EuroLeague playoff destinations. We're going to share a lot of behind the scenes on our Discord channel, Closed Basketball Community, which is available, which is open only for BM Plus members. So join us on basketnews.com slash plus to get this and also a lot of other extra features such as um, our bonus Q&A episodes. Augusta's breakdowns. Also, we have new show "Give Me Control," which I will, uh, which I believe will be really relevant through the throughout the playoff uh, uh, journey. If you remember, last year we had some crazy officiating experiences during the playoffs, and now we have a former top level uh, Euroleague European basketball referee and also. Uh, referee coach Todd Warnick, who is giving us analysis uh, of some of the biggest calls, some of uh, the important moments that might be decided by the officials. So we're also going to record those sh uh, these shows probably after every game, unless we're going to have a perfect uh, officiating. Let's let's hope for that. So a lot of stuff coming out on Basket News. Join BN Plus community on basketnews.com slash plus. We already discussed the biggest game of the play-in so far. Not much to say about Maccabi and Basconia, so I would just go with your predictions for 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 the decisive mm. play-in game. You already mentioned you're I picking said, Basconia. I um, said I'm picking Basconia, although Chima Moneke got hurt yesterday, and I'm not sure if he's going to play. But one way or another, I think they will win in Buesa. Uh, they actually beat Virtus away in, in a very important last regular season game. And I do believe they will have a much better night. Uh, honestly, to me, it seemed like Basconia gave up like in the middle of the second quarter, realizing that they will have a chance at home against FS or Virtus. And probably it's impossible to uh, catch Maccabi being down 20. And Maccabi, you can just see how the game started with Lorenzo Brown hitting a couple of frees, feeling good about himself, that this was probably his best performance of the season. You have Baldwin and Brown combining for 55. And my general take about the game was just that Basconi is just too small. Like, too small in every position. Yep, they, that's they, true. They were killed uh, on the court with Maccabi's aggressiveness, the way they were going for offensive rebounds, and, and in general, just too small. When, when Maccabi saw a target like Marcus Howard or Chris Chioza, um, they attack them, they, they get to their spots. They easily create those mid-range shots that are very comfortable for Wade or, or for Lorenzo Brown. And 
also fast break opportunities. I mean, they just seem like a team that doesn't really belong in a play-in. They seem like a team that could get to the final four. Uh, however, I, I still pick Basconia over Virtus in, in one game in Buesa. You said uh, that Maccabi were too big. And I wanted to say one shout out to Antonius Cleveland. We haven't been talking much about him, I think. Yeah. But uh, yesterday he was he had the task of guarding Marcus Howard, and apart from that one three pointer, the from very the, first moment probably, and Marcus Howard showed up on the court, right? Uh, not not the first shot because he took the first shot after like two seconds after stepping okay, on the court. Okay, not the very first shot. And, yeah. he, and he missed that. But uh, the baseline out of bounds play, where he, Marcus got a three pointer in the corner, that was his only made basket uh, in the first half, I think. And um, he shot one of eight, and a big reason was Antonius Cleveland and his defense. His length and his athleticism proved to be the perfect, let's say, uh, kryptonite for, for Marcus yeah. Howard and this insane shape recently. Because I said in the last podcast, this guy was averaging 27 points per game in Europe in the last 10 games. That's, I don't know how many times uh, anybody has ever done in Europe that this, this big average. So um, he was physical. He followed Marcus everywhere on off-ball screens. I loved what he has done. And uh, basically it decided the game for, for Maccabi. And the other part that you mentioned was like Basconia waited for the Friday game. But at the same time, Cody Miller McIntyre was playing in the fourth quarter when everything was decided. And I, I don't uh, think they have players. To, to step on that court, actually. They I don't, don't know. They don't really have backup. Sandra Ayeste played 46 seconds. Yeah, Chris Chioza Theodore, played six Chioza. minutes. Maybe, yeah, you could finish with Theodore. I, I did not really understand why you had Cody Miller, McIntyre there, down down 30, down 25. Tadas Sedekerskis played 34. Cody Miller, McIntyre played 31. Hmm. Well, maybe I'm not sure maybe how... Dushko didn't give up, but it seemed from the player's body language that I like mean, they realized it's it's over yeah. but he still had to be there on the court to finish finish the game yeah so. sure i mean obviously i'm not sure if if that's going to be a big impact for friday mm -hmm. you know these the, these guys playing uh 30 plus minutes but at the same time i was like why they're still playing yeah, yeah. that there is a chance for injury but but whatever are um, you picking basconia as well i'm picking basconia i picked the them before the play-in okay. yeah, you have to stick with the i have to stick pick. now yeah. i have to stick now this like <laughs> this is like the perfect scenario for my pick before the plane so but uh it's really hard i think to win two away games in the same yeah. week uh, i'm talking that's about true. Virtus. yeah a lot of effort so. was there in sananda them and to recover in few days another away game victoria it's it's going to be hard and i think they arena. got they got back like at 3 a.m this night yeah they have a day off and then they're flying tomorrow for victoria it, it's not easy also for basconia they are not a great defensive team safe to say like uh yeah. maccabi made 19 frees out of 36 that's a crazy number but they, they maccabi so has, has star shots. power in in perimeter virtus doesn't I think it makes life a little bit easier for Basconia for mm -hmm. them to survive with all, all their defensive liabilities. So yeah. although uh, they still allowed like over 90 points in the last matchup. Yeah, but they managed to score 94. I think it was 94 91 or something, something, like, something that, like that. Yeah. So they won't face players like Lorenzo Brown, Wade Baldwin and uh, that basically just score out of every single pick and roll action mm. they, they they played it will be a different ball game and at home you know when they catch the rhythm uh, marcus howard even against a very good defense if he he gets hot you you can't really mm -hmm. stop him so um, you definitely uh, cannot put marco it, 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 should marcus be, howard. No. <laughs> it should be a bounce back game for basconia my eyes it, it, there are two different basconias one that is playing at home and one that is playing away exactly. and i'm believing in that Basconia that plays at home, way more than the one Basconia, than the Basconia that plays away. It's like For sure. two different teams. Hey, but it's but, not but such at the a same big time, difference. They're 10 and 7 at home and 8 and 9 away, including this one. Okay, not it's excluding just, this one, but still. It's okay, but it's just not the, a big difference in my eyes. I think it's ah. just the feeling you have about them and maybe some of the games... Uh, they also count the, the games they played in the beginning of the season before Dusko arrived. Like uh, that was also yeah, a they different lost a lot of home yeah. games yeah. as well. So I agree with August. At home they are different, and I think the fans, the crowd will be up for it definitely. But Bus yeah, but Bosconi needs Chima, 
Kashima to play. It's going to be super hard if he's not playing. From the first reactions, yeah, from the picture that we had yesterday, I think he's not playing, and that's that's bad. Oh, it means like 38 minutes of Tadas. Okay, he can do that. Yeah, he can do that in three days easily. He can play 17 minutes in three days. Yeah. I had another question actually for you. You didn't share your prediction. Uh, I, I will go with, with Virtus just because, you know, to make it more interesting. To have you know? a variety of Yeah, opinions. because, it, I mean, right now I feel like it's 50 50, uh, but I like Virtus' momentum. I think that they will carry on this confidence that they got in Istanbul. And I just don't like the the way Bosconia lost to Maccabi, like giving uh, giving away the game so so early. I didn't mm-hmm. like the way they started it. So I think that at this moment Virtus just deserves it more. But it's up to Bosconia to show up and to, to show a different uh, face. Uh, regarding Maccabi, I mean it's it's hard to um, take something important from this huge win by Maccabi, it was a blowout game. But to me, what was huge was Lorenzo Brown's start of the game, confidence and shot making he 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 showed in the first minutes of the game. He scored 21 points, I think, in the first half. The last time he had 20 was at Christmas time. And it, I had this feeling that Lorenzo Brown is not the same as he was last season. It was a difficult, inconsistent season for him. But I thought that if he, you know, if he brings this momentum to the playoffs, man, it's not going to be easy for Panathinaikos. Because just in general, I I love what Maccabi is doing this season, being one of the most consistent teams in the Euroleague, playing away all the time. I think that's that's huge. It's a little bit underrated, the way they uh, managed to stay on top. And as you mentioned, they shouldn't be in the plane. They're top six caliber team. Just because of the competitiveness in this tournament, they had to play this single playing game, but they proved that they do not belong here. Uh, so I think that it might be a little bit more interesting than a lot of people think regarding the playoff matchup against Panathinaikos. And I just wanted to hear your uh, ideas, uh, Ritis. What do you think, first of all, about this poten- about this upcoming matchup between Wade Baldwin and Kendrick Nunn after what happened on social media and just in, in general? We are going to share our playoff predictions yeah. in the upcoming episode, but your first look at what we are going to have in, in this pair. Uh, well, my first look is that Panathinaikos still remain clear favorites with the home court advantage in, in, in Oaka. So Maccabi has to split the first two games uh, to have the chance to win the series. But they are capable. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to see teams with two very interesting defensive schemes. I believe that Maccabi is probably leading the league in deflections. I don't have the advanced stats with me, but that should be true. Yeah. Uh, which leads to a lot of fast break opportunities. And if Lorenzo Brown is cooking the way he, he was yesterday, we are once again talking about the best perimeter duo in the league uh, that we witnessed last season and not necessarily this season because of all the struggles that that Lorenzo was facing. And Wade Baldwin is Wade Baldwin, you know, he does what he does. And I don't think there is a discussion about Wade Baldwin versus uh, Kendrick Nunn at the moment. I'm sorry, I don't want to disrespect Kendrick Nunn. It's his first season in, in, in Europe. He's proving that he can score. Wade Baldwin has been doing this for consecutive quite some seasons time, yeah. for quite some time. And at the moment, he's the mid-range king in this league. And, and, and you're thinking about him as a MVP contender just because of the first part of the season. Maybe he's not in this discussion, but in general, he is MVP caliber player. So um, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, there's nothing to prove in, in, in here for Wade. But at the same time, Wade... You know, we value Wade because he was in the Euroleague for longer while Kendrick Nunn was doing his thing in the NBA. Yeah. So it's not like I think you can value. I agree that Wade is in the MVP discussion and Kendrick Nunn is not. Yeah. But at the same time, you can give more credit to Baldwin just because he was longer in the Euroleague because the other guy was in the NBA, which is better level. No, but he has proven that that he is probably the best uh, or top three guard in the league right now, and Kendrick Nunn hasn't done that yet. Right, and, right. and as Wade Baldwin responded, well, you don't even have the stats to show it. Show right. for it. Like Kendrick is averaging 14.5 points per game with yeah. 10 in mm. PAR. Yeah. 
I mean, it's okay, it's good. But it's going to be it, interesting it's, series. It's, it's nothing special so far. It's going to be an interesting series for sure, because Panathinaikos have a lot of defensive weapons as well to prevent Maccabi from doing their thing. Uh, I think there will be players that, that will decide a lot, like Bonzi Colson, for example. Uh, okay, let's so, keep these matchups for the I upcoming mean, episode. I, We're in going general, I'm just, I'm, I'm just looking forward to yeah. it. I'm excited about it. I still see Panathinaikos as heavy favorites in the series, though. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, pretty much it about the plane, right? Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. go with the EuroLeague regular season awards. And would you like to start with the all EuroLeague team? I think so. It's. I think it, it will be way more unpredictable maybe or at least yeah. it has potential to be a little bit more unpredictable okay so we'll go with the, with the individual awards uh later okay so bring it on all your look team by august but i just uh should we go position by pos i mean one by one but at the same time did you go pos i think positions shouldn't exist in in this discussion. because i try to keep it you know a little bit because last year's Euro League, all all Euro League teams didn't make sense at all to me. That's true. It's like I tried to be, you know, either two front court and three back court, or the vice versa. You know, mm. three and two or two and three. I but tried to stick to this idea until this year, actually, because when I saw what they did with the all Euro League teams last year, I mean, if Euro League is not trying to keep it like as standard as it could be, I mean, why we should? Pretend that we're trying NBA to NBA doesn't have continue positions something. for, for yeah. all NBA. You can have an all NBA team consisting of five guards, for example. I don't think we should okay. be that strict about positions, but but, it, but let's see. we will choices. include some big men. That's, yeah. that's obvious. Yeah, let's see. Okay, so uh, I think we all have Mike James in our first team. He's a lock. Yes, sir. I also think every every three of us have Wade Baldwin in there. Yes, yep. sir. And I also think we all have Matthias Lazor in there. For sure. Yep. And then this is where I think it gets tricky. Because I valued uh, first team is like you have to be good on both sides of the court. You have mm -hmm. to have good stats. Uh, mm -hmm. Your team has to be winning. Your team has yep. to be winning. And uh, you have to have great, possibly really good net rating. Which means that... Okay team is doing really good with you on the court and uh, probably best if if it's doing way better when you are not on the mm. court you know so yeah so i had uh facundo compazzo in the first team Same. i have him too you all have that's going you to can't be really have the first podcast, team without yeah. without the yeah. player from the best team in the league okay and i know exactly. his numbers dropped a little bit but it's just because they clinched the first seed yeah, but talking Early. talking about his numbers, like they were the first seed, and just remember how Real Madrid uh, were in the last regular season. Yeah, they were not as dominant, and now with Campazzo, it changed the whole picture. Like in the first half of the season, they looked like they don't belong in this league. They looked level above anybody yeah. else, and uh, he's the best player. They have the best net rating with him on the court. They are 19 points better with him when he's uh, with him than without him on the court. That's yeah. huge. And we all see what happens when he is not out there. Like the second unit is is not close to the level, uh, to the to the lineup that uh, Madrid has when Campazzo plays. So I, I really think he deserves it. But my And my and fifth pick... I, I will just yeah. add, because we, we, we should actually go probably player by player with these picks, although we kind of agree that mm, we basically have all the same all your league team, but let's give arguments why the, the, we put them in the first team. And just in Campas's case, I also have a couple of extra arguments. First of all, he's fifth in points, points created through scoring and assistant uh, in the league. Uh, he's averaging almost 19 points created through scoring and assistant, assisting. And as I mentioned, he made Real Madrid undeniable number one team uh, in the early compared to the last year. And he brought Madrid four extra wins, which is 12% growth in winning, and which is the second highest growth in winning this season and the second best after Panthenaikos, after this incredible mm. turnaround. And what is four wins, you may ask. It might sound not as huge, but if you put four wins for Partizan, 
which didn't make the playoffs, now they would be in the top six. So in this EuroLeague, four wins is huge, and that's the impact that Campazzo made. All around performance, I mean, I also ha had some doubts, but I feel confident putting him in the first team. Okay. So th these are my arguments. I, I for couldn't Campazzo. imagine the the first team without, the, like I said, a player from from the number one from Real Madrid. From Real Madrid. Yeah. That was so uh, dominant. Talking about the other guys, what's really impressive, and it's 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 a pity to leave out Shane Larkin. I would like to have him in the first team, but just because of his team underperforming, yeah. I'm probably gonna put him in the second team. But uh, it's impressive that he played all games this season, all 35 games. I didn't miss a single one. And the same goes about Mike James. Didn't miss a single game. Uh, in the past, uh, well, he had some situations, let's say, where he was suspended or injured and he was missing some games in the regular season. Now he played all 34, started all 34, played an average of 31 minutes. And but he has been super consistent, so uh, he has to be here. Matias Lazor didn't start every game, but again, didn't miss a single game. All 34 he played and and, and he was consistent and he he was the best center in the regular season. So if you want a big man in, in your five, he has to be here. My extra arguments about Mike James, he creates yearly high 30 points per game in scoring and assistant, assisting, which is 37% yeah. of total Monaco points. Uh, he is the second best scorer in the league on, I would say, efficient shooting. Uh, 48% from two and 38 uh, from three. Yeah. Given, I'm, I'm saying that it's a fishing shooting given how contested his shots are, how much of defensive attention he's getting on a, you know, a daily basis uh, and how hard for him it is to score and to average mm -hmm. those 19 points per game. He's second in total contested field goals made, first in ISO shots made. His team produced top six offensive rating in the league and his team also uh, got the third seed, uh, which is also Monaco's uh, all-time high yeah. so far. 20, so 23 wins, that's just really impressive. In, in a different season, it might yeah. get you the first seed. Exactly, exactly. And Wade Baldwin, well, the second part of the season, the way he's been playing. Insanely good. Yeah. 20 points per game, 4.8 assists, only 2.2 two, uh, 2 .2 turnovers, great percentages, 47% yeah. overall, 41% from free on 3.8 attempts, just just putting Maccabi on their back, yeah. on his back. Be because Lorenzo was struggling, so they yeah. were more dependent on Wade. And I think last year we, we kind of thought that it was more Lorenzo Brown's team. Maccabi. Okay, we we all you know recognize it as a the best duo in the Euroleague, but I think that Lorenzo Brown was that number one guy in this uh, Formula One team. I think it, it right was now? it was subjective. You could, it was like everybody had their own opinion because probably they were so even because Lorenzo had a really great first part and then Wade also had a super great second part, and you were like, okay, so whose team is it? This yeah. season, this season, there is no yeah. question. No. Yeah. He had yeah. a tough start. He had to miss games because of an injury in the beginning. But when he got his rhythm, it's not like it matters. He became unplayable a lot. I think to those and guys. And when he's focused, no. yeah. when he's focused, when he doesn't get those technicals, doesn't get involved in all these uh, arguments with the refs, he is unplayable. And yeah, that's definitely all Euroleague first team material. Even though it hurts to leave out Shane Larkin. Yeah, actually, last, mm. I had Shane Larkin in my first team before last night, and I thought that making the playoffs is is huge in my my selection. It's my individual choice, but I thought that you cannot be on the on the first team if you didn't make mm. the playoffs. So I then I that switched probably him makes to the sense. second team. So the last spot uh, in, in 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 this just few arguments about part. Matthias Lazard, what I liked uh, about his advanced stats as well. You know, we kind of mentioned everything what he does on the court. So. He is also the best in advanced stats, and he's first in total points created from off-screen assists. That's a very interesting stat to me, and he he, he won the first place by a big mar margin, although Tavares was close, but all the other guys, they're like 70 p points uh, below. Uh, first in a screen assists, and first in fouls drawn, and of course, one of the most efficient bigs, probably the most efficient big uh, in the league. And number four, number five spot that I had, or at least now we're having a, this discussion, I had a lot of doubts about it, starting from the positions, starting from the players that I should include. 
And I just thought it was my last minute change, also mainly based on Shane Larkin's situation. And I thought that I shouldn't overthink. I'm just bringing Jan Besselet to my all EuroLeague team. I mean, I think that he's the main reason why Barca is the top four team in the EuroLeague. I think he's the main reason why Barca is the top five defensive team in the EuroLeague this year. He is just amazing all around player, amazing defensively. The his, his sharp decisions on offense were extraordinary this year. And he's just really solid. He's super important to his team. His net rating differential is 20 points per 100 possessions, which is which is huge. And you can clearly see that on the court when he's not on the floor. Barca is struggling with him. It feels like everything is just perfectly set, both offensively and defensively. And just giving his personality, his leadership, leading through the example, uh, it just shows how great the player he is and how great the season he's having. So I just decided to bring second center in the all year team. Would have helped yesterday playing center back. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm picking Mr. 50. Okay, yeah. yeah. Nigel Hayes Davis. All right. Uh, I mean, he's he leads the league in minutes played, I think. He's like 31 and a half. That, 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 that's just crazy average. In minutes. The team was so dependent on him. Um, of course, he broke the record, but that's not the main reason why I pick him. I think consistency, uh, the importance on both sides of the court. Uh, One of the last best... season, we saw a lot of improvements in his game, in his shooting, and, and, and this season he had great numbers, like 58% from two-point range, 39, almost 39% from three-point range. As I said, consistency is, is, is key, and he, he has been the most consistent player for Fenerbahce under both head coaches. Under mm -hmm. Ritudis in the in the first part of the season, under Sharas in the second part of the season as well. Um, I think he belongs here. Yeah, I cannot complain. I have him in my second team, but uh, for the most part of this inner consideration, I had him in the first team. I just decided to make this late minute move with Jan Wesley, bring him to the first team. But yeah, you, you mentioned the consistency. And when I think about the best two-way players in the EuroLeague, he's for sure one of the best. And if we're talking about the best two-way forwards in the league, he's probably the best one. Ogis seems to me... I have like both of these guys in, in the second team. And... Uh... I have Nigel Hayes and Jan Vesely in the second team, and I think uh, you could easily make a case for them for the first. I'm not mad at all you you picked those two guys, but I I I gifted this to Chima Muneke, and okay. uh, what made my decision is probably his uh, net rating numbers. But Basconia are almost 15 points better when he's on the court, and uh, to compare it when he's not. To me, that, that's the best result in, Bas in all Basconia's team. And I'm not going to mention his stats because we, are, we all know that he had a great season. I think the energy, the grit that he brought on the court uh, was a big part of why Basconia were successful this season. Without that energy, without uh, his style of play, I think they don't, don't, they don't go far. And I know he's like the only guy from the first team that's not in the playoffs yet because we have Mike James, Baldwin, Campazzo, and Lesord. All uh, guys are in the playoffs already. But I think I think he deserves it. But at the same time, I'm not mad mm. at you guys picking Vesely and Hayes Davis because I both had them in the in the second team. So how your second team looks like? And Moneke does it. Why I didn't pick Nigel Hayes Davis, I just remembered, because he plays 31 and a half minutes and Moneke is averaging like only 23 and has similar uh, averages. Uh, during this, during uh, like yeah, he eight, eight minutes less on the court, so I thought I thought that was important as well. Mm. And my second team, Jan Vesely, Nigel Hayes Davis, amazing seasons for a lot, a long part. I thought Jan Vesely deserves to be the best center. Uh, yeah. His mid ranges were elite. Yeah. Mm. At one point, uh, when they played Jalgiris, he was shooting better from the mid range than actually from. Around uh, the rim? Around the rim. Okay. That was a crazy stat I found out doing the research. And then Nigel Hayes Davis. To me, 50 point game was not that impressive. But his overall season, what he did on both sides of the court, was just amazing. He, I, I would love to have him on my team. You know, if I was, I was the GM, amazing player. 
And the next three guys. So I have Alec Peters there. Okay. Just spectacular shooting percentages. Uh, his true shooting is, is I think, second to none. Uh, he basically, if you gave him, if you created him an opportunity to shoot, he was ready to make the shot. He, he, he wasn't missing. And Automatic. And we all talked about Slukas and Vizenkov leaving Olympiakos. Uh, he was he replaced Vizenkov. I don't know. You couldn't imagine a better way to do so. So yeah. mm. I had to include him. Plus Olympiakos uh, made the playoffs directly. And I don't know. The two guards, I picked Keenan Evans as my probably, you know, really a lock here. Just because I think from the at the guard spot, He's one of the best guys uh, to play on both sides of the court. Because a lot of these guys that, that, that you mentioned, you know, a lot of these scorers, a lot of these best EuroLeague players relax a little more than Keenan Evans does on defense. And he was playing really well for Jalgiris on both sides of the court. He was, like, defensively, he was not a weak side for Jalgiris. Yeah. His net rating is, is incredible. Jalgiris were way way a better way more better team than than without him so i mean, keenan evans is a one-man orchestra i think that the only player from all all these guys that basically was dragging the team on his own mm. uh, others had much more help than keenan evans in conus uh and what is crazy to me is that he manages to somehow sustain a 43.5 percent shooting freeze knowing the degree of difficulty of his shots. Most of his shots are heavily contested and and he still manages to, to have 43.5% from downtown. So yeah, even though his team didn't make it even to the play-in, I think he has to be in the second team, I agree. And uh, Shane Larkin is also on my team. Chima Moneke didn't make it to the first team. Obviously, I put him in the second. The same goes about Jan Vesely. Uh, and then, actually, since I, I don't care that much about positions, I thought that Josh Nebo deserves to be here as well. I think this season right. he has been really impressive. The impact he has on the court is huge. Like, even yesterday, you saw that for Basconia, sometimes even with three bodies, it was impossible to get a defensive rebound because of Josh Nebo and his power. Um, I think this is his breakthrough season, even though in the past we also saw that he's good. But uh, this season he he reached another level, and I think he's uh, a top three sender this year in the same discussion with, with uh, Lasor and, and Vesely. So I don't mind having right. a, a, a second team with two centers. That's Vesely and Nebo. Mm, on my second team, I have Shane Larkin, Keenan Evans, I picked Alec Peters and Nigel Hayes Davis as my sole forwards because I had two centers in my first team. And the different name that I had compared to your uh, all your teams, I thought that Kendrick Nunn has to be there in my second year league team. Over Shane Larkin? No, I have Shane Larkin in my second team. So over who? Shane Larkin, Keenan Evans, Kendrick Nunn, uh, Alec Peters, and Nigel Hayes Davis. Mm. Oh, so you don't have Chima. I don't have Chima. I feel bad about it. But I have only two slots mm. for forwards. And I just thought that, you know, what Alec Peters did consistently, you know, minimizing the loss of Sasha Vizenkov, being so efficient, stretching the floor 51% right, right. shooting yeah. from free. Oh, his number is crazy. He's currently the most accurate accurate three-point shooter all time per uh, career uh, average which is also huge. And if you noticed, I think that he improved his off-ball play so much, of course, thankfully to Olympia Cost system. And it was only the second season where he made more twos, where he attempted more twos than threes. But the difference with the first one that this year, it was a big, big margin. So it just shows that he was more utilized as an off-ball player as well from cuts, from, from different situations rather than just a, you know, uh, stretch uh, for options. So he stepped up his game. He was really efficient. And in the year one to cover the hole left by Sasha Vizankov, he did just a tremendous job. And I had to... and. 
because of the reasons you mentioned the Nigel Hayes Davis I just couldn't find space for uh, Chima Moneke and for me the same about Alec Pierce and can I just explain the weird reason why I didn't pick him and uh, that's because I do see Olympiacos as a as a unit as a team so much dependent on their system and it is so hard for me to single out individuals even though Alec Peters has the numbers as you said but I mean this team is so strong as a unit and Alec Peters is just so much better in that system uh, I think the guys that I chose basically um, they were good on their own uh, like they made their teams uh, that much better on their own. I think Alec Peters is like a, he's a great player. He's a great spot up shooter. He has been for uh, at least six years in Europe. But I think the Olympia cost system makes him that much better. Yeah. So I didn't include him in this. In this, uh, I definitely would have him in the third team if if we were building it. That's a weird explanation. I I, I know, but <laughs> you had to leave somebody out. Yeah, and in Kendrick Nunn's case, I had a couple of arguments. Uh, just give me a second because I had him for another category. Yeah, so Pantlenkos went 21-7, and seven, which is 75%, and which is only 4% less than Real Madrid, after signing Kendrick Nunn. And I think that it was a turnaround moment for Pantlenkos, what he managed to give to his team and what he managed to add to Pantlenkos uh, game. He became the top 10 scorer in the EuroLeague with 15.4 per game uh, points per game on a decent 46% uh, shooting from two and 39% from three. And I checked that the last EuroLeague rookie to average 15 points per game was Andrew Gaudelak who had 17 per game in Fenerbahce in 2014-15 season. So to have a rookie making such a big impact quickly is rare, even you know despite Kendrick Nunn's resume and the status that he had in the NBA. And he also was a top four scorer in the EuroLeague at the second part of the season. And again, he was a big reason why Panathinaikos managed to, to clinch the second seed. So that these were my arguments for Kendrick Nunn. Okay, you convinced me. I'm taking off Shane Larkin off the second team. Oh, really? Kendrick Nunn. Wow. Shane, you're taking off Shane Larkin? Wow. You convinced me, Donatus. Wow. Sh Why not Keenan? Keenan uh, has way better net rating. Okay. FS are 10 points better when Shane but, Larkin is off I mean, on the bench. I, I know that's not how you think because if he's not totally there, they're not a better team, of course. Mm. But at the same time, uh, I don't know. One team improved heavily with Keenan Evans on the court by the numbers. The other did not. And the numbers they have, the absolute numbers, the averages are really similar. Mm. So, okay. And as I said, one, one plays extremely good defense. The other, you know... Is is a target for yeah for, the defensive the part is, is is underrated. I mean, there's there are just some obvious things like the size. Exactly, Shane Larkin is smaller. Keenan Evans is bigger, and, and that Shane, helps. Shane is quicker, but that size in the Euroleague, and I think it, it's often overlooked. So, and we often talk, oh, he averages this points. Oh, he's the main guy, the main engine. I understand that, mm. but one guy is not. A target defensively the other is and and that's also important that's not a knock just, just that that just how other teams play you because you are undersized and and it's not something you can change true the true. only thing that i have to add about the net rating rating that this stat is a bit tricky because it also tells a lot about your second unit and when you look at drag the second unit you know the difference between keenan evans and others is just too big to cover in Shane Larkin's case, probably Rodrigo Boboa was coming off the bench with Elijah Bryant. I cannot recall who was, you know, the main point guard of that team coming off the bench, but maybe also it kind of had a big impact on Keenan Evans' numbers and as but, well as some other players that have a good good net rating. Okay, if you if you look at the net rating difference, that that's what what you're saying. But uh, if you look at just personal individual net rating, uh, Shane Larkin had a negative 1.5. When he was when he was on the court, FS mm. were losing by one and a half points, and that's normal because they lost uh, more games. A lot of games. He spent a lot of time on the court. Yeah, that, it, it's it's normal. Keenan Evans plus five point four. 
I even I'm, even though Jalgiris lost more games than they won also. Not gonna argue with the stats, although uh, it didn't convince me to include Kendrick Nunn in the second team. And and it's funny that we in this discussion we didn't even mention the Alfonso Ford Trophy winner. Oh yeah, because Marcus Howard is the top scorer of the regular season. Yeah, but and his team might be in the playoffs. I I know all the reasons why. <laughs> I know I I know I, I just wanted to say that yeah we have. A lot to choose from, considering that the top scorer of the league is not even in, in the discussion. I left out, I feel bad for leaving out like Siobhan Shields. Amazing season, yeah, but yeah. he's penalized for mm -hmm. for Milano underperforming. I left out Josh Nebo. And, and I, I was thinking... I left out Alec Peters. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 think I was choosing he, between him and Josh. And yeah. I, I, left, I feel bad about... Even Tornika Shengelia, he exactly. was huge of this virtual success. Exactly. And, and you know, uh, Mario has only a great stats oh, in, in yeah. limited time. Uh, Tavares, Even lower Tavares. stats than usual, but, you yeah. know, his impact, you cannot mm. measure that. Mustafa Fall, amazing season, passing mm. the ball, doing everything for Olympiacos. So. Shengelia probably was in our first team uh, mid-season awards when his team was the second seed. Could be the case. Yeah, but then then Virtus dropped, and his game also yeah. dropped. His game, all, all, he, he also, of course, he had missed injuries, some games but, uh, because of injuries. But I actually had him in this conversation between mm. forwards: Alec Peters, Chima Monek, and and Tornika Shengeli. I was picking Alec Peters over these two guys, but so he was really close, both as Chima. Having a third Euroleague team would help uh, a lot, actually. Yeah, it would make our job way easier. Yeah, although with. 18 teams participating i don't think we need three teams yeah this yeah. Um, these awards are meant to be uh for people to discuss who's being left out who deserves more respect mm. and if you make free teams then basically you're not leaving out any mm -hmm. uh, i mean you're leaving out some talented good players but all of the greats will be there mm. For sure, when you pick 15 best players in the league. And these all your teams that are always crazy because especially fans of their teams, they're looking at things from their own perspective. And I can definitely see, usually it's what what the argument that Olympia Cos fans use. Oh, so Costas Papanikolaou is playing table tennis, right? You can see these comments and something oh. like that in every all your league team conversation. So uh, of course, look, a lot of I, people I, are coming I, 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 it's, it's not just Olympia Cos fans. Oh, it's, it's, no, no, no. it's every team. I just, every most every fan team base fans. is like, I, and I understand it because like we watch the league, uh, we watch every team. and But if you watch the EuroLeague in the way that you follow one single team and you see 34 games of Jalgiris, and then you see all the other teams, only those two times when Jalgiris played them. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, you will have much stronger opinions and arguments for Jalgiris players than than the rest. Uh, and the same goes about Olympiakos fans, Panathinaikos, Partizan, or any, any other team. So I think it makes sense, and, and the fans don't really have to be objective. It's, it's those people that actually vote that, that we demand to be objective and... and uh, you know, to choose carefully because it's still a responsibility to, to vote for the MVP for the all EuroLeague team and, and, and mm. the other awards. Yeah, and put all your uh, put your all EuroLeague teams as well in the comment section. We want to see, we want to hear your voices. First team, second team. Yeah. Yeah. That's should we, should we go to the awards? By, by the way, I just had this quick idea that if we would make an all year league team of teams that didn't make the playoffs, I mean, the list would be crazy. We had yeah, Nikola Mirotic, Shane Shields, starting five. Shane Larkin, <laughs> I don't know, Serge Ibaka, you know, so Keenan Evans, Shields, Evans Larkin, yeah. Clyburn, I mean, a lot of guys. A Not lot a bad guys. team. Not a These, bad team. In any other year, they could all easily make the first EuroLeague team. Simple as that. Wow. Okay, we have a few other individual awards where... Okay, maybe we'll see some interesting picks. Let's not, let's not spoil... Definitely uh, not in the MVP conversation. Oh, yeah. 
I mean, the quarterfinal series might mess this up, but it's, it's that's it's, why it's we're g- picking these regular season awards. That's yeah. why we want to we spread are being this fair. idea. We are being fair. Yeah, that's why why we want to change in the Euroleague as well. Let's make regular season awards, not some Euroleague season awards that are mostly sure. biased on the playoff performance. For sure, uh, uh, Mike James should be the unanimous MVP of the 2023-24 Euroleague season. Period. But is, let's is say, it even a thing in Europe? Like. Do we know if if a guy is unanimous? Who even who even votes for for the MVP? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't vote. <laughs> Do you vote oh, the MVP? Others? Give me a second. I think so. I think media members they have their voice. At least for the all yearly teams, it's a um, vote combined with fans, coaches, team captains, and also journalists selected media members. I would have check you the, voted? Not yet. There's no no last vote year's. yet. I f- yeah, I think so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, you're like MVP. You should do like Ken, what Kendrick uh, Perkins did yesterday, like uh, announce, his... annou- announce. He announced his teams on Twitter, and uh, Milwaukee fans said, "Here, um, Giannis is not a unanimous first team All NBA, although he had uh, the first season in NBA history with 30 plus points on 60 percent field goal shooting," and uh, they were really mad on Kendrick Perkins. So. If you would publicly announce those, I'm doing it right now. Basically, I'm, yeah, I'm, he just yeah, he's doing. I'm just uh, it, so. you are voting probably after the quarterfinals, so that might change no, your no, opinion. I'm, I'm as going well. to <laughs> quote like based on my current picks that I have. To be honest, all right, I'm not but, going but to wait for it, the But put it out on Twitter because there is a way bigger reach there than yeah, this than you say, is say, saying publicly on this podcast. No, I need reach on the podcast. I need reach yeah, on okay, the podcast. Okay. I want to make this podcast more so, popular. Uh, I'm still checking. I'm still checking how the vote is. Whatever. Proceeds. Just let's just go to the I don't know MVP Mike James. Easy. Do we even need to talk about no, this? No, I don't think so. When was the last time uh, there was no basically conversation about the MVP? Edith, you are the historian in this podcast. I don't think I'm a historian. Yes, you are. Out of out of us three, you are. I maybe have the best memory. Um, I think last season was pretty clear about yeah, Bezenkov. I agree. Okay. The moment Olympiakos made it to the Final Four, I don't think there was a question about Bezenkov. Right. I think Mitsic MVP season was also pretty obvious. But was it that season when Mirotic was Mirotic, basically a front runner all the time before he was, the playoffs but, but happened? After the qu- okay, so maybe, yeah, it wasn't that obvious. Yeah, so I would say that it was quite yeah, open yeah, race. Yeah, it was an open race. Uh, uh, but, but last season Vazenkov it was pretty good. We had Vesely in 2019, Luka Doncic 2018, Sergio you in 2017. Yeah, he had a great season. I don't remember who were the other players considered for the MVP, but as far as I remember, he was a pretty clear MVP that year. That was Sergio Yui before he before the ACL mm-hmm. injury. Yeah, and just for the record, the MVP is chosen. Is picked by fans, media, team captains, and head coaches. Oh, the same as the all Euroleague teams. Okay, but okay, so uh, top three MVP candidates because we all know who's number top one. Top three. Uh, um, I, I have, have to include Wade Baldwin. Wade Baldwin. Wade Baldwin. Who Wade else? Baldwin, Mike James, and Lasor. He or might have a case. Or Campasso. I'm between Lazor, Compasso. Yeah, so we decided it's Mike James and Wade Baldwin. You're thinking way too much, and that tells me more than enough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But uh, what happens if none of these guys win their playoff series? What happens if Fenerbahce use like box and one defense all series long and they no, make it to the final four? And Mike James averaged eight points per game on 32% of uh, shooting. A, and Wade Baldwin has crazy se- series and they advance to the final four over Pantlaikos. I think it, it's going to mess up everything. As long as Monaco makes it to the final four, you have to vote Mike James as the MVP, even if he, let's say, underperforms in the series. But what if Monaco loses? That was my question. Well, if they lose, then I I still have Mike James as the MVP because to me it's a regular season exactly. award. But yeah. I know that the concept is different, so probably uh, the award will go to someone who's in the final four, and it could be Lasor or Campasso. I just hope Euroleague don't mess this up. I just hope Euroleague don't mess this up. I don't know why we need to talk about the quarterfinals i mean yeah, this is crazy. the right time right now to yeah. vote for the regular season mvp and that's it coach of the year i thought more about after your question 
And to me, it's Ergonatum, unfortunately. Okay, sure. I managed to convince you, right? No, I just, you know, because that, that question was, I, I wasn't prepared for it and okay. I didn't do any research. Yeah. And while I was thinking in the last podcast, I was like, yeah, it's probably Ergonatum because who else is there? You know, I was choosing between him and Chus Mateo. But at the same time, he got Campazzo in the summer and Ergen Ataman had a completely new team mm. and uh, managed to make this team play at such a high level. So so quick. Yeah, I have to... Yeah, he, he got the roster perfectly. He then got Kendrick Nunn. But it's not given that if you have good players and look at FS or Milano, mm. your team will play good. So... Yeah. I think that's a huge merit goes to him and his coaching staff, and and he deserves the coach of the year. Probably, probably yeah, probably so. Again, if if Maccabi wins the series, Katash is the coach of the season. But but you, but you yeah. just said, look at the regular season. I'm I'm, I'm saying how he this thing has works. His case. I'm just saying how this thing actually works. To me, yeah. again, it's a regular season of war, yeah. so definitely it should go to Ergin Ataman. Uh, choose Mateo won the regular season by a by a fine mile. margin but it to me it's between ataman and and sasha bradovic and, and i think uh, sasha had his team playing a very consistent basketball for second year in a row they were the fourth seed last year the third seed this year and it deserves a lot of um, credit but um Panathinaikos is a team built from scratch and I know we expected them to be in the playoffs. We expected them to be good, but we probably didn't expect them to be number two. Mm-mm. For sure. Yeah. So Ataman should be the coach of the year. Yeah. I presented my arguments in the last podcast. Yeah, yeah. No need to repeat myself. Uh, rookie of the year. Kendrick Nunn. We stay with Panathinaikos. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think absolutely. To me, it was that. Cody Miller McIntyre before Kendrick Nunn happened. Miller McIntyre has a really strong case here. Because to me, he's real rookie. He never played in the EuroLeague. He never played on a high-level team. And there were a lot of doubts about his ability to adjust, to adjust, to adapt. He was thinking about retiring before this uh, offseason, before signing with Basconia. And his story, triple-double, leading his team to the playoffs as the floor general of that uh, team, uh, being all-around player as well, providing solid numbers, one of the best numbers among the rookies. I'm, to me, it's, it's a solid case. It but is, it's second it best is. case after Kendrick Nunn, yeah, unfortunately. Kendrick Nunn, mm. And he played a, a lot of games. He played 28 games. It's not like he joined after the New Year or something like that. He played almost full regular season. Yeah. I, mean, I know that first three games for him was like a warm-up, but yeah. uh, in, in the end, he he was the guy for Panathinaikos. And now I'm thinking that in the summer when they signed all the players, it didn't look like they need an extra guard. But knowing uh, how Luca Valdosa was underperforming, uh, mm-hmm. you're thinking that without Kendrick Nunn, they wouldn't be the second seed. It would be impossible. He made That's true. he he unlocked the full potential of that team. His scoring yeah. ability, of course, everybody got uh, their chemistry uh, rising as the season progressed. That's also true. Everybody got comfortable with it, it, each other. But without him, that team is not second seed. I don't not think even we're there. talking home court advantage. I'm not sure no, about that. No, for sure not. So uh, what Cody Miller McIntyre did this season is super impressive, but just Kendrick Nunn is a, is a better player and, and the best rookie, I think, this season. And this turning out to be Panathinaikos Awards. After all the hate Panathinaikos took in this podcast, right now it's Panathinaikos Awards. Finally, we woke up. In really? Panathinaikos fans' eyes, finally we woke up. I, you, look at I look at look face. at Rita's face. Look at Rita's face. He's yeah, stunned I, by I, I, yeah. I, I had a phone call with Yanakopoulos and he Did you took your paracetamol this morning? Me. You know, uh, I took my Red Bull for because, sure. Uh, <laughs> because you you knew what is, what was what is about to happen. <laughs> and uh, should we go to the defensive player of the year award? Uh, where? Ah, uh, okay. You I, can follow. I know where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're going with this. <laughs> Could you have Ritas as your defensive player? John Brown the third. Oh my okay. god, the monocle. Okay. <laughs> Are you Can happy I with that? I'm answer? Surprised. Are you happy it's with that? It's a Monaco and Panatonic Cost show. It was in his contract to bring at least one okay, except for Mike James to bring to bring already, another Monaco player. He already got mine. On the podcast. 
Are yeah. you happy okay. with my answer? <laughs> I'm not. I had <laughs> him in my top three or four. There are a few names that probably we also had on our ballot. Him, Thomas Walkup. Who do Jeremy you have Grant. defensive player? I actually decided to make it. Uh, I mean, I tried to not overthink of this one. I tried to make this defensive player of the year award unique this year. I want to give this co-defensive player of the year award for Eddie Tavares and Vincent Poirier for their collective efforts protecting uh, the rim. Uh, they both combined for 88 blocks in the year league, which is more than 12 year league teams. Uh, Madrid limits their opponents to the world's second uh, two-point shooting, which is only 50%. They have the second best defensive rating, their first in blocks per game, their first in defensive rebounds, first in uh, worst three-point shooting percentage allowed. And I think it, a lot of comes from having these big guys for entire 40 minutes per game which is a, a cheat in my eyes so, so yeah you're this just guy. giving the, the award to players yeah yeah this guy maybe you should award a coach as as the defensive player of the year a coach no. yeah no. Eric Nataman for having the best defense in Planet and Coast. No, no, I'm not going no. to No, but what is this? When you said... Yeah, I was covering said... Eddie Tavares, you know, gap in the first few games of the Euroleague like, season. And I just <laughs> wanted to make a little bit more exciting because we're going to just to repeat the same names for 30 freaking minutes. But is this... I need to spice if, when things you, up. When you said, I'm, go I'm giving out this award for two guys, I thought it's going to be Mustafa Fall and Thomas Walkup. You can because do that. they do a... A lot of work sure yeah there and it's like you one, can, one is you protecting can the rim make a case for that one is protecting the perimeter and i was like but two centers i just cannot they're not playing even at the same time i just cannot recall such a great defensive center lineup in the year league august do you want to just say jerian grant and finish this <laughs> yeah, yeah my defensive player of the year goes to jerian grant he left so many guards uh with their lowest points total during this season Absolutely phenomenal job, super aggressive. And Panathinaikos had one of the top three defenses in the league for the whole regular season. So mm. I just thought he deserves it. Okay. Breakout player of the year, the last award. Fenerbahce mascot yellow. Ah, okay. Okay. Wait, what? I, I, I missed something probably. And you complained about Eddie Tavares I and San Poirier. I think Fender Mascot Defensive Yellow the became award. a thing this season. I think his... Uh, he made a breakout his, in the mascot his, game, his, right? His fan base uh, exploded on Twitter. I think he has oh, all, what did like I miss, 500k followers or something like that. Uh, what were the highlights of the mascot? I remember uh, him uh, taking the scare shit of... Uh, yeah, the way he scavages. greeted Shadas, yeah. uh, The way he actually was involved in in a conflict when there was some sort of a uh argument between players i, I don't remember yeah. who fenerbahce was playing and he was the one just like ah, pushing everyone. yeah yeah right that was the uh, first time i think he put his name on the map any important season. shot game winner big free pointer you see him anytime the team celebrates you see him he takes all the spotlight i think he is the best mascot in the euro league right now i think he's the rocky of, of Euroleague, Rocky being, of course, the Denver Nuggets mascot, the highest paid mascot in the NBA. Uh, I think he had a breakthrough season. <laughs> a year ago, we didn't even Thought about know that guy, who right? that bird is. And, yeah. and now that bird is everywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm looking. We didn't know who on, that bird on, on is. On Basket <laughs> News Instagram, when, when Fenerbahce was on a winning streak, they were a hot team. You had a photo with, with the winning streak numbers. And, and in the middle, a... it wasn't Nigel Hayes Davis. It, it was that bird. <laughs> okay. Okay. I think it is his breakthrough year. I'm and looking at all the tricks he did this season, and there was like scaring Sharuna Sisikavichs. Yeah. Uh, trying, to, that's huge. trying to push away Yusufa Fall when he was angry at the referee. Yeah. Like, okay. that's an opposing team player. And he was playing mind games with refs. And uh, here he was like, uh, Marco Guderich is doing the warm up. And uh, he's like trying to imitate what Marco Guderich is doing during the yeah. warm up, stretching his calves. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Now I have to reconsider my award, but from my the pick, players, but I will go from with the Chima players Moneke. pool. I'm also going with Chima Moneke, but he will, yeah. he was also on the headlines. He got all the well deserved spotlight. Amazing rise from the four point per game player. And from a misused player, from a player who was 
close to play and sign in EuroCup or BCL just to enjoy basketball again. He joined this Basconia team. And to be honest, I was a bit skeptical at first because I really love Matt. I still love Matt Costello a lot. And I thought that, okay, Chima and his minutes might clash a little bit. Is it a good idea? Because Costello is a, is a really great player. And despite the challenge, he found his role, he earned his minutes, he made the case for the all EuroLeague teams, top 15 in scoring, top 5 in rebounds, top 12 in steals, top 25 in block. He's, he's all over the place in the EuroLeague and... Top 1 in YouTube. Top 1 in YouTube for sure. So, <laughs> amazing year for Timo Moneka and I hope that he, the injury won't be that serious. I would love to see him playing the last playing game and making a difference. Probably it, it, it won't happen, but it's, it's Chima. You never know. I have nothing to add. I have the same pick. And uh yeah, he he was he never basically was even a role player in the year league before. Like last season with Monaco, he was barely playing. Yeah. And when he was playing, he was not doing much because he was never seeing the ball. He was basically a defensive player and to step into this huge role and make such a big difference immediately in your first season. Like Alec Peters probably was my second pick here, but at the same time he was in the EuroLeague for so long. Yeah. He knew what it means to be an important player, not yeah. as he is right now, but uh, he knew what it feels like. So I think what Chima did is is a little, just a little bit more impressive when you're talking about breakout. The bird only has 47k followers. I thought it was wow. much more. I, I didn't know him. I, wow. I did not actually. Wow, I don't wow, know wow. if it's, it's a. If it's it, quite if disrespectful, it, if, to be honest. I don't know I'm if sorry. it's a no, he or a she, but let's it's, call it a bird at the moment. Ye yellow. Uh, you didn't know about yellow. We're going to make a social media, you know, clip for sure, just to help yellow increase Get the number of followers. All the highlights should be there. Yeah, it will be there. It will be there. That's it. Uh, I actually have few last funny awards that you were not aware of. I just cannot find this. Okay, I found this quote. So, just a few awards. Let's quote go. Quote of the year. The president of Zvezda, Chovic, what is important to us and where we will try to make a big step forward is the EuroLeague, where the goal will be the final four. That's what he said before the season. Will Clyburn, if the anybody- The bottom four, he meant maybe. Wow. If Bill Clyburn, if anybody had any doubt who the best free in Europe is, it's still me and will be me. Ettore Messina, Kevin Pangos is not the right driver for our car, and Shabazz Napier is sending texts to his friends saying he would love to come back to Milano. Or Paulus Yankunas, we express full confidence in coach Max Vitas, and Max Vitas gets fired in two weeks. So, who's your pick? <sighs> it has to be Zvezda, man. And that's fun. an elite list, I would say. Fun. That's a crazy good Jan list Kuna's you quote made. was my favorite. I think. That was my favorite quote. I think in Lithuania, for at least a month, oh, yeah. it, it, there was this joke that... It's still I, a joke. I, I have full After confidence four in you. I have full confidence yeah. in you. <laughs> hey, it's still a joke. It hasn't ended, I think. Or or the one where I don't, I don't comment uh, any rumors. That's from the same press conference. Yeah. The press conference in general was was great. But I don't know, just Zvezda illusion of having a super great team that's worth of a final four is just, you're so far, you were so far from reality. And it's not like it, it wasn't expected at the start of the season. Like, I don't know, maybe at least for me, I did not see them as a playoff team even. And I, I could I, see them fighting for the play in spot. Yeah, I think we had them close in the power ranking, close to the play in. I mean, like 12 or yeah, 13. Yeah, we should but check the, our. But he mentioned final four, guys. Yeah, it's, it's a bit delicious. They finished bottom four. That's, you know? <laughs> that's, yeah. Will Clyburn after yesterday? Okay, that's also funny. I have to admit, I, I don't expect any rational comments from some of these uh, presidents, owners, or GMs. Unless you're Polish and Kunas, because he's, he doesn't I, I want do to expect, make the headlines. I do expect yeah. rational comments from him, because he's... As irrational it sounded he, he, at that he's moment. He's a calm guy, and yeah. now he's... He's a good guy. Now he's, gonna be he's the, a good guy. the president of the team. Yeah, yeah, now he's the president. Maybe he will become more irrational right now, after becoming the president. I don't know, man. Maybe he will be just more relaxed. But yeah, to me, it's also Jan Kunas. Anyways, the, okay. the second one. Uh, the fairy tale of the year. Cody Miller McIntyre from almost retiring to Mr. Triple Double. 
Uh, Nigel Hayes Davis from four, four point average two years ago in Barca to 50 point record, or Ife Lundberg from Exidor in Bologna to hiring a nanny in Bologna and becoming a clutch player of the year? Hmm. I think the fairy tale of the season was Gianmarco Pozzeco trying to shake up things in Villarban. I have a <laughs> Pozzeco for another, for a last award, actually. I have to go with Cody Miller. Like going from retiring to to getting a triple double in EuroLeague is, is it's solid. It's, uh, it's, it's solid. a great case to me. That's yeah. that's the real fairy tale because Nigel Hayes was in the in the EuroLeague, Ife was in the EuroLeague, mm -hmm. and and this guy wasn't known by many people, and now he's doing triple doubles. I'm voting for Berutus right-handed floaters. Okay, you, you are that's you're taking the tale. other answer <laughs> yes. and include yeah. your own. Yes. Okay, that's a good choice. That's Berutus fair. right hand of floaters. Donatus, who do you have? We don't care. Alternative okay. of the year. We're running out of time. Alternative of the year. Um, alternative in coaching with Gianmarco Pacheco jumping on Asphalt players, getting ejected every second game, and calling his players best in the world. Uh, Dusko Ivanovic, not good enough for Zvezda, but brings Basconian to play in and potentially the playoffs. Uh, Chima Moneka's YouTube channel and James Nunley, who continues picking alternative basketball websites other than Basket News. Gotta vote for James Nunley just for the culture. <laughs> Gotta pick my guy. Uh, I don't get this beef between <laughs> Basket News we and never. James Nunley. We never. He, only he gets it. Yeah. So. I like him as a player, though. Uh, Great player. He's actually underrated player in my eyes. In the last few years, he was really, really solid in Partizan. They, they should extend him for sure. He was a big part of, of, of Jelko's Fenerbahce as well, although the numbers might not show it, but he was super important with his catch and shoot, shooting abilities. But anyway... Please, uh, James, unblock us. Unblock us. We, we, we praised you enough, I think, yeah, to get us unblocked. I don't, okay, I don't think he cares about what we say, but... Eventually, uh, he he does. Well, there's the there are there is this type of people, and I would include myself in it as well. Uh, you might you have a bigger chance to get a reaction from me if you say something negative about me rather than saying something positive about me. So That's how it works. And I will definitely respond world. to a negative comment on Twitter, but it's not a given that I would respond to a positive comment. So, uh, but out of these, I will pick Dushko. Because Dushko's effect is real. Uh, <laughs> he's the unofficial mayor of Vittoria. The only thing they have to do is continue signing him in November. Do not let him run the full preseason. Or build a team. <sighs> Maybe uh. building the team is not so bad, but just don't let him do his preseason routines. Sign him in November and he will continue making the playoffs. Easy. And our tip, join BN Plus community on basketnews.com slash plus. Thank you all for Do watching. Do it, James. See you quick. <laughs> join join See you BN soon. Plus. <laughs>